Welcome back to Bits Andy. I'm back. <laughs> they notice I'm wearing the same thing from my Houdini video, but it's because um, it's still middle of the night and I'm getting kind of tired, but uh, I figured since I bothered to do full like camera makeup and everything, might as well knock out one more video. <laughs> face was still presentable. So I figured I would do uh, another one of these um, book to movie talks. This one I'm going to talk about The Road by Cormac McCarthy. If you haven't read it yet, the basic idea of The Road is it opens with this uh, setting of uh, kind of a post-apocalyptic uh, in a way world where um, Cormac McCarthy doesn't give you a lot of detail as to what has happened necessarily. He kind of leaves it to your imagination, but he does tell you that there's been... Uh, he, again, doesn't give you a lot of specifics other than to tell you there's been some sort of plague-like illness that's gone through the world. Doesn't tell you exactly what it is. He just kind of hints that uh, it was some sort of epidemic that has wiped out the majority of the at least the state's population where the book takes place. I can't speak for the rest of the world because <laughs> they're they're not really brought up in the story actually. It's pretty much just like North America territory is where we're looking at. I think it kind of starts near like Canada area um, that borderline and then the father and son in the story want to work their way down south. So there's been this um, mysterious epidemic that's wiped out a majority of, I'll say, North America's population. And uh, there are some people left, but they're, they're very scattered across the states. Our protagonist is just one of a few people that have survived, uh, pretty much just through determination to survive. Much of what we get to know about the little bits that McCarthy does give us are given as far as like what happened um, to the world and to this guy's family, it's all told through the guy's flashbacks pretty much while he's on this <laughs> kind of road trip with his son. So we we do learn that um, before the epidemic happened, uh, this man did have a wife, uh, was very happily married, had a nice little life going, and then uh, I think it was around the time that things turned really bad. Uh, she was pregnant and she had to have her child when all of this hysteria was going on, when all these people were dying left and right. Uh, she had to have a home birth and that's how he gets his son. The wife hangs around for the first few years of the son's life, but then through that time gets more and more depressed about the situation, gets more and more manic. She just, she wants a way out. She early on starts talking about like, this isn't gonna end well, they're gonna come after us. And it's kind of a mystery as to what she's referring to, but she just keeps going on about that. Like, we, it's just, it's not gonna end well. And he's more like, we just need to stick it out. It's gonna get better. You know, we're a family, we're strong as a unit you know, giving all those pep talks. And then finally one day she just gets to a point where she's like, nope, <laughs> I'm, mm -mm. no, I'm checking out. I've run this as far as I'm going to go. Basically, she comes to the decision that she would rather just <laughs> go out and let what will happen happen on her own terms rather than waiting for somebody to come and find her and possibly uh, attack and kill her and her family. So she just walks out one day and it's not really said what happens to her. It, again, it's left up to your imagination. As much of this novel is, it's left up to, for you to make up um, what might have happened to these people. So the guy is left to raise his son on his own and <laughs> kind of like his wife prophesied, things get worse and worse and he gets to where he realizes he needs to leave the house they're living in and so his son and him set out on a road trip, kind of, like I said, because they don't have a car, so it's all on foot. The father doesn't really have any definite plan, per se, other than he just feels like if he can get his son south, that's all he says, is if we can just get south, if we can just get to the coast, it'll be warmer temperatures, maybe we'll find a better food source, 
maybe we can find some people who can help us. You know, it just, it just feels like we're gonna have a better life if we can get south. Because where they are, it is very cold, very dreary, very desolate. The majority of the story, and it's, you know, as you can see, it's not a very long book at all. <laughs> I'll show you here. It's very widely spaced and the writing is very sparse, so you only get a few paragraphs per page. The majority of the story ends up being basically the dad's inner thoughts while they're walking towards the coast and this takes weeks, months. They're traveling from very northern climates to the south. They know they're not going to hit a lot of people along the way and the father just figures that the majority of who they are going to run into are probably going to be more than likely unsavory types that are in very much survival mode. They could be armed, they could be carrying diseases, they could be off their rockers mentally. <laughs> He's like, you don't know what you're going to walk into. So his number one priority at all times is how to keep his son safe. That's really the only thing driving him is his son, is he's living for his son. And that becomes a big, powerful statement in the book. Being in this situation where all things are pointing towards this this end goal being very hopeless and pointless, but you have this one thing you're latched to that is keeping you driving day after day. I'm a little unsure how to talk about this book because in the back of my mind I keep thinking about all of the negative reviews I've I've read about this book and before I read it I was going into it hesitantly because I've heard so many not only booktubers, because I've heard a lot of booktubers knock McCarthy, but also just in general on Amazon and Goodreads. Um, just a lot of reviewers, period, talk about how disappointing this book was. And I've seen so many reviews about how there wasn't enough action and there wasn't any point. And even on Goodreads, I noticed when I went to log this book after I'd read it, a number of my friends, not just like Goodreads friends where, you know, you may not know the person necessarily, my actual friends that I'm friends with on Goodreads that read, um, <laughs> a lot of them had marked it much lower than I did. And so I was a little bit, <laughs> and I don't know why I would be hesitant to do a video of my own opinion, but I don't know, I guess I figure people aren't going to hear me out because they've already made their opinion. Um, but I was just, I figured I would give my stance anyway. Just in recent months, I've heard a handful of booktubers talk about McCarthy and label him a hack and, and just like really burn him. And I'm here to say I was honestly impressed with this book. There is not a lot of action. There are a few scenes here and there where things do go down when, um, the father does run into those unsavory types he was fearful of, but that's not what propelled me through the story. The thing that kept me going was just the story of this father, just the the point of view of being a father. Um, if you take away, put aside all of the apocalyptic dystopian elements, all of that, don't even think about that, I'm just saying, to, like, <laughs> to, to see it from my point of view. Um, if you put all of that aside and just look at it as a novel of a relationship between a father and a son and what drives a parent to do what they will they do, you know, to be that parent that will do anything for their child. The scenes where the father gets into these battles with himself. There's one scene that really struck me. Uh, where <laughs> there are a number of scenes in the book where um, when the father gets the son, and I'm, I'm just calling him the father because they're not actually named in the book. It's just the father uh, and the son. Nobody's, at least with our main characters, nobody's given actual names. There was one scene in particular where the father was just um, talking with his son one night when they were on the road. Uh, there's a lot of scenes where at the end of each night they're around a fireplace and his son's very, I don't know the exact age of the son. I'm, I'm guessing from the way he was written, I'm guessing he's somewhere between the ages of like 10 and 12, somewhere in there. During these sort of like 
fireside chats at night, um, that's usually when the kid brings up questions he has about life because remember the kid was born into this so he has a lot of questions about what life was like before and the father does his best to answer what he can remember because he's been living with this for some time now. There was one scene in in the novel where um, they're having one of these chats at night and then the son goes to lay down and the father tucks him in and it seems like a very you know, basic routine night and then the father is sitting with the son watching him watching his son sleep for a while and then um, there's a description where he kind of goes off the father goes off by himself a little bit and he just bursts into tears and it's described how he's just he's fighting with himself because he wants to do everything he can for his son but he's battling that sense of not being good enough, not being a good enough father, even though he's doing everything he possibly can, he feels like it's not going to be enough to keep his son alive. And he has to deal with that every day. You know, his wife took off, so he doesn't have that support system to be like, honey, you're doing great. You're doing the best you can. He's going to be fine. He doesn't have any of that. He just has himself in his own head. And his son doesn't know he's going through that. I mean, his son will tell him, hey, dad, I love you. But, you know, I think, like, <laughs> I'm trying to come at this from, you know, not having a child of my own, but understanding from an adult perspective when you're around children. There's a different way you communicate with children and the way you communicate with adults. And when you spend a lot of time around children, you get to where you do need that adult interaction. I was thinking about that with him is like, who does he communicate with that's on his level? He doesn't have anybody to bounce frustrations off of and he just has to live in his head all the time. I, I guess I was, I was touched by it because I had a very problematic, strained relationship with my own father that at times was really disappointing, but at other times there were also moments where I saw my own father in that kind of situation where I could walk in on my dad and see him just crumpled and crying like this this broken man because he wasn't doing enough or he felt like he wasn't doing enough or, you know, I grew up watching my dad fight all these demons of mental illness that constantly gave him doubt and um, constantly, you know, in his own head, belittled his efforts. And I saw, I don't know, there was a, there was a side to the father in this book where I saw my own father. And maybe, I don't know if maybe that was why I got a different response from people, from other people that had a negative perspective of this novel. But there were a lot of scenes just in that parent-child element that um, that really spoke to me and and there were a number of scenes in this book where I actually teared up and maybe that was just because of my own experiences with the parents I had. One of those moments that that really spoke to me was there's a conversation the father and son have in in the book where the son asks his dad dad are you very brave and the father says mm, I'm only medium brave and he said, well, and the son asks him, well, what's the bravest thing you've ever done? And there's a pause. And the father said, got up this morning. And that just hit that one line. Bravest thing I've ever done is got up this morning. Just hit me in my core because I've been in that place. And when you think about it, that one small act does take a certain amount of bravery to push through all the bullshit that hits you every day and just get up again tomorrow and try it again tomorrow. That is an act of bravery in and of itself that isn't given enough credit. The fact that you tried again tomorrow. And damn, when I read that line, it just slammed me because it just, it brought back so many moments in my own life and um, so much darkness that I've pushed through 
And I, before I read that line in that book, I never considered that necessarily an act of bravery. But w after reading this book and thinking about it, I was like, shit, yeah, <laughs> that is brave to not give up and say, I'm going to go on faith that tomorrow is going to be better. That is an act of bravery. So yeah, I in fact did get a lot of out of this book. And you know, uh, for now, I know Cormac McCarthy has his naysayers. I've seen it enough on booktube. But for now, I don't have a reason to be disappointed with him. So for that, I would say at least try it. At least you're going to hear a lot of crap against him. At least try it for yourself and see what you come out with would be my stance. I was pretty impressed with it. Um, I will say this is one of those books that has no quotation marks, uh, which normally is one of my pet peeves. I normally hate it when, uh, when authors do that, because it's just, it's a very useful tool, quotation marks. But something about the way McCarthy writes it, writes his characters, I didn't have, maybe because it's the majority of the book happens between an adult and a child. I had no problem following who was talking the majority of the time. Um, but just heads up on that if that's a peeve of yours as well. As far as the movie adaptation, liking the book as much as I did, I didn't really have much fear going into the movie because it. I already knew going in that it starred Viggo Mortensen and I, I don't know that I've seen a role in him, a role he's done that I didn't like. I've seen him in movies where I didn't necessarily love the movie, but I, I haven't seen too many roles where I didn't like his role in the movie because I just, I think he's an amazing actor because he always puts everything into it. Uh, so I knew he was going to be amazing as the dad, but damn, <laughs> damn, he nailed the father. Uh, and if you happen to have a chance to watch this movie on DVD as opposed to like on TV or on demand cable or something like that, I would recommend watching the behind the scenes uh, options, uh, the little documentaries and stuff on the DVD because there's a lot of cool uh, backstory in there. And one of the things Viggo Mortensen himself talks about is uh, they're talking about how he, he went on a near starvation diet prior to doing this movie so he could get that lean look of somebody who has been fighting for food sources. Which that by itself, I was like, Ugh. I mean, it's impressive, but I'm always a little bit worried for the actor because I know that that can be hard to bounce back from. Um, but <laughs> one of the stories he tells is while he was shooting this movie and he had that physique, um, not necessarily when he was shooting scenes, but like when he was off camera and doing other stuff and just still had that body frame. He talks about going into businesses and being thrown out because they thought he was some vagrant homeless person that that was stinking up their business or something. And he said, I got kind of mistreated a few times just because I had that shaggy, uh, starving look. It's not a great statement towards how we treat the homeless. <laughs> um, but uh, it was also, in a way, kind of laughable that uh, that, that happened to him. Uh, so he does talk about that. And then, um, I, judging from the, the way some of the, um, the world, uh, like the environment, is described in this book, as far as, like, how the environment always rains this ashy type of material and it's very gray and barren and how the trees tend to just fall over at random times. Uh, I was thinking a lot of the environment was going to be CGI'd to create that effect but it turns out and they did and they said they did CGI some of it but it turns out the majority of the movie the director actually had everybody go to actual disaster areas that hadn't been reformed yet, like uh, some of the areas in New Orleans from where uh, Katrina hit, uh, some of those areas that haven't been rebuilt, they used some of those locations uh, to to recreate the um, post-apocalyptic uh, sense in the storyline, which I thought was kind of cool. It's also kind of scary when you watch the movie because 
you're when you watch the documentary and then you watch the film and you realize that's what they did it's disturbing that you when you when your brain says oh those places actually exist and actually look like that oh there's also <laughs> a pretty cool story with uh Charlize Theron who plays the wife of Mor Mortensen's character in the beginning of the movie she only has like a very short scene like the wife does in the novel um but there there is one scene where they uh do the the birth of the son in the story and <laughs> she talks about uh, how uh in the script she read that they were gonna do this at home birth scene because you know it's the world's going to shit there's no hospital to go to and um the director she said the director told her the type of scream he wanted to hear he's like oh there's no way you can recreate that on command um so you're just going to lip sync it basically and then we're gonna go back in and put in a voiceover scream on top of that and she said that she was actually a little bit offended that this man was telling her that she could not find it in herself to do a primal birth scream so she's like you know what that's a damn challenge <laughs> and she said she got in that tub and just thought of every horrendous pain she could think of and just let this creepy ass just deep in the bowels of hell primal scream come out of her and uh, she said that she managed to pull it off to his satisfaction, but she did end up straining her vocal cords and did have to go on vocal rest afterwards. But she's like, damn it, I did it though. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty funny because that is an impressive scream in that scene. The other thing I would note about the film is that if you're sensitive to scenes that have a more graphic nature to them, I will warn you, there are some pretty graphic scenes in this novel or in this novel, in this film. Uh, there are uh, a few brief scenes of nudity. Um, there is one where uh, Mortensen's character strips down to go shower naked in a waterfall, which, you know, some of you might be like, oh, Mortensen, that probably looks good. Well, no, he has the starved physique, so. Mm. <laughs> um, and then there's also a nudity scene that even creeped me out a little bit where they go into a house that has people hiding in a basement and there's all these like naked half mad people kind of writhing around that one kind of disturbed me uh and <laughs> then there are you know when you think about it like I said there's no hospitals in this world because who's gonna man them uh so there's a lot of scenes of well not a lot but there are a few scenes of what I would call like primal first aid <laughs> primitive first aid where you just kind of doing what you can with the uh implements you have which isn't always pretty there are some scenes with a lot of blood i think there was one scene that had like sinks full of blood there's also some scenes where people get sick and they're like coughing up blood that was like the worst of it that i can remember now for the most part the movie does follow the novel's path pretty closely. There are a few things where they switched it around or took it out, but I mean, that's a given usually when you do a book to movie adaptation. Um, one of the things I will recommend you watch for is near the end of the film, um, Robert Duvall has a small part where he plays, I think a guy's name is Eli, he plays this old man that the father and son come across it's a very small scene even in the book but uh it it was one of those characters where they're only there for a minute but they're pretty impactful to the other characters in the story and Robert Duvall's performance of Eli was just amazing. He's another one where I'm like I have thought of movies where I maybe didn't necessarily love the movie but I can't think of a role off the top of my head where I hated Duvall's character. I mean, from from the time he played Boo Radley in To Kill a Mockingbird up to his stuff now. I, there are characters he's played where I didn't like the character, but I can't think of one role he's done where I didn't like his acting in the movie. He's another one that's just freaking amazing. So yeah, the, the movie has a lot of merit on its own. Um, this is one of those ones where I feel like I don't know that I could pick one or the other as better. I feel like they make a good team together, a good 
story experience paired together. So those are my thoughts on the book to movie adaptation for The Road by Carmack McCarthy. And I guess that's it. We'll see you in the next time around, guys. Thanks for watching. Bye.